Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Today I'm with a very special guest, the one and only Campana. Yes. How you doing? Doing good, doing good. What about you? I'm doing pretty good. So, Campana, how did you get your name, Campana? I don't know if you've been asked that or not, but I like. Oh yeah, never heard so, of it. So, uh, Campana uh, is Bell in Latin and Spanish, and Bell's my last name, so oh. kind of just worked out like that. <laughs> that makes sense. I was yeah. I kept getting it mixed up with Santana. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, you have a fuck ton of accomplishments. So let's just start right there. You know, like just go over the rhythm and flow thing, the um, battle of the bands, musicology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's see. Let's start with so 2016. Um, we got uh, like sort of like our buzz within the Seattle scene uh, when I. Uh, did the EMP sound off it's now the Mopop Museum uh, with my band Cosmos and we ended up uh, winning that competition in 2016 and then from that it led to a whole world of opportunities we played at Bumper Shoot and Sasquatch um, and then later on within 2017 uh, we did Block Party a lot of local events local festivals things like that um, and then from then uh, in 2017, we did uh, Musicology 2019. That was hosted at Princess Paisley Park uh, the same year that he passed away. Mm -hmm. So that was that summer. Um, he passed away in the spring. But that was just a super surreal experience, being able to do that Battle of the Bands competition on the soundstage, which is his stage, his, uh, his venue within uh, the Paisley Park estate. So that was super cool. You could definitely feel the energy within there. Um, and then uh, from that, we've still done a lot of shows here and there. Um, but aside from, you know, working with Cosmos in the band, uh, I've always done music under my solo brand as Campana. Um, so I have a lot of projects out uh, with solo music. We did a debut album, uh, with Cosmos called Moonshine that's out streaming everywhere uh, back in uh, 2017. Um, and uh, I dropped a couple projects within 2018, uh, just solo. And uh, at the top of 2019, participated uh, in the Rhythm and Flow competition uh, with Netflix and was able to uh, fly down for that. Uh, and yeah. That's dope. That must be like a a great ass resume to say you were on a show that was part of Netflix. Yeah, and like I was, I was on, I was on the show and not on the show, kind of in the same, same breath of mm -hmm. things because we got flown out there and everything, got the whole like experience, but literally there was like ten of us who didn't uh, get taped on the actual audition. Uh, portion of it um, and I was so happened to be one of the 10 people but mm -hmm. like it was regardless it was a good networking opportunity met a lot of cool artists from that uh, I have a real good homie that I met uh, just from that whole experience uh, named Jay Walk uh, and he's now like working with management with a couple of my homies up here and he happens to be a Tacoma native but lived out in Arizona and now lives in Long Beach so it was it was a cool opportunity as a whole. Yeah, for sure. I never really like a apply for competitions because I feel like even if it's like a keep like what are those things or like applying to the back of like a cereal box or anything like that. I never yeah. do those fucking competitions because I feel like I'm never gonna win. I feel <laughs> like I, I always do those because I'm like, hey, you never know. Like and I like especially when it's thing like things like pertaining to like talent and things like that. I'm like you know what, I, be, I believe in myself and my talent. And at some point, I think there will be someone in some position who also sees that to some extent where, you know, the right exposure will happen within that element. And I feel like that was kind of an opportunity that, you know, happened with rhythm and flow, just the whole nature of, you know, the film industry and, you know, how Hollywood works. It was a very Hollywood situation that happened out of it with mm -hmm. us not being able to actually be taped for the auditioning. But, you know, we knew it's life. <laughs> yeah, it's like when an actor has, like, a very small role, they're just, like, in the credits. And then, like, you, you look at those people's credits down the road, 
and they're like, oh, they started out in that, and then eventually you'll see this on like on the, the big screen or whatever. It's the same thing with music, yeah. basically. So it just yeah. adds to your resume, you know. If you you might, you might not, you might, you might have like an ID IDMB page eventually, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that's funny you say that because like, I'm uh, like I really like uh film, and I really like all things like pertaining to you know crafting artistry around my music that's not just the music aspect but like developing a whole brand around it so with my new album I'm working on I'm actually shooting a short film for it um, oh yeah that's pretty we're, we're being pretty ambitious with the approach of it um but I think we're gonna pull it off pretty nicely I bet dude your newest song with um Alex Wiley that the visuals behind that were even dope oh yeah thanks yeah so that was directed by a swim team and uh, I'm actually working on the short film with them. And we've been having a lot of meetings, a lot of writer's room sessions. Alex Wiley has also been involved in some of those sessions as well. And just a lot of other people that I'm working with hand in hand uh, to, you know, make the film come to life. Because when it's, you know, projects like that, it's like you can't do those things by yourself. Mm -hmm. It's like it's always good to have other minds put together and you know collaborating to produce the best product that you can and so like I believe in everyone that I work with so I know if I believe in myself and I believe in the work they're doing only good things can come out of what we're doing hell yeah teamwork makes the dream work yes sir. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get back on Alex Wiley but did you see the that Kanye's um beautiful dark twisted fantasy just like hit the 10-year anniversary oh yeah I did see that yeah it um that that um the movie the short film for it it's fucking nice. that is it, it's phenomenal it's still a very beautiful art piece and i would be wrong to say that like even if, if it were on a subconscious level that i wasn't influenced by things of that nature as far as in the short film uh music video realm like more with more like dialogue and music tied into things mm -hmm. but so it's not like a straight music video but like that's pretty much like a prime example of like an approach that we're taking with this short film uh because it has like its own story that's tied to the album but features songs from the album on the short within the short film yeah like nowadays you can't like just be an artist either you know like you have to be yeah. even like a director or like just visual aid is so important nowadays <laughs> yeah like i heard something a while back that always has stuck with me is that people listen with their eyes nowadays it's a very like visual time that we're living within to where it's like in order to like captivate people's attention like they need to be visually stimulated at the same time as they are you know with listening so um i really try to hone in on aspects of you know providing like a whole bunch of different content from different angles you know mm -hmm. like even look at fucking tiktok like the songs yeah. <laughs> i don't personally have a tiktok but you know like if you're on instagram they fucking made it tricky so it's like tiktok seeped into like instagram reels and yeah, all that type of with stuff the reels and shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like <laughs> TikTok, some of those songs are just like annoying ass, like auto tune noises. They're like fucking yeah. like, they're just like little, like, oh, it's like a ringtone thing and they'll have like a visual basically. Yeah. Like, and I don't think people, if they, people actually like took time to listen to what the words are or whatever the ringtone sound is, they'd be like, what the fuck is this? But they're more into like the dancing or whatever, like the yeah. memes from the TikTok. Yeah, exactly. It's like if, the song probably wouldn't hold as much weight as it would on its own. You mm -hmm. know? It's almost yeah, like a I mean, TikTok is like a, it's like another type of artist now, like a SoundCloud artist and like a TikTok artist. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely like the new generation, like coming into like their own, you know, realm and order of artistry that, you know, like, when I was younger, like a lot of people were on MySpace and like pushing music that way and things like that. Um, and, you know, even more so nowadays, like, I mean, like, I'd say like 2014, like tw 2010 to 2014, you know, SoundCloud was super huge, uh, you know, 
there were SoundCloud artists going up, which you don't really see too much nowadays more than like a TikTok artist like mm-hmm. popping. So But yeah, I think I think SoundCloud has turned to like another platform like Spotify basically. Like Drake will even release his album on SoundCloud, but of course you have to have like a subscription or something to actually listen uh-huh. to those songs, like previews of songs now. But it's just mm-hmm. like another platform at this point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how did you come to meet Alex Wiley? Like I've been following him since the very beginning, honestly. Yeah, so I was that's like, dope. holy shit. I heard that he actually recently moved to Seattle also or something. Yeah. So he, like he's like a neighbor. Like he I live uh within the Capitol neighborhood. Uh he's up here as well. Um, so yeah, I've been following his stuff since like 10 day with chance uh like back in the day like I'd say like what 2012 maybe Mm -hmm. 2011 so that was right when I was like getting out of high school like uh I grew up in Bremerton uh in Kitsap County area and that's deep for people who are not from Seattle that's like deep yeah like south of Seattle it's like the ferry ride that everyone just fucking saw Tyler the creator on like it's it's on that it's on that side of the water (laughs) so uh yeah, I grew up over there. I moved out to Seattle uh, after high school, so in 2012. And, like, that's, like, the music me and my friends bumped. We bumped, like, a lot of, like, the Chicago area music, like Chance, Vic, Alex Wiley, Kim Bay X. A lot of those cats are, you know, people that we started, you know, listening to. And, like, how I, like, figured out from, like, you know, the person who, like, led me to dig deeper into that scene's music, Chance, is I figured out about Chance from a Childish Gambino mixtape, yeah, Royalty, yeah, yeah. in 2012 when that dropped. Because That was fucking that nuts. That's one of my yeah. favorite mixtapes. Yes, it's fucking... a really good mixtape. Uh, What's that song they have with um Schoolboy Q and... Uh, Unnecessary. Unnecessary. That's yeah, fire. Yeah. Or he's got Nipsey Hustle on it even. Oh, yeah, God. Black Faces. Yeah. He no, that he really cut up with that project. And yeah, Childish Gambino, he's my dude. Like that's my favorite artist for sure. And I've been following him since like like just getting into high school, like 2009, 2010. So just following his whole trajectory, like I found out about chance just you know by keeping up with his catalog and then just dug deeper into that realm of things and then from there you know figured out all their music but the reason I'm telling you all this backstory is that um all of that led to you know me following them on Twitter keeping up with their social medias and like you know Alex uh and you know like Kimbe and others they're like really personable people so like uh I chatted with them on Twitter like years ago wow um before they've had like the extensive platform that they do now um and we've been following each other on Twitter and I just would send him my music and he was like oh like you're dope so we ended up connecting that way Wow. And like he was, uh, the, there was a, a time where Kimbe was out in Seattle and I ended up kicking it with him. Damn. And then there was another time when. Is Kimbe uh, signed to TDE? I know Isaiah Rashad he, signed, but like he's working he, with them closely. No, he's like, he- he's like fam with them though. Like he's like, like Snoop Dogg basically with them. With, um, NWA kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say that. That's a pretty good reference. But, like, I know, uh, I think one of his managers is a manager uh, within TDE. So, like, he's, like, he has that close affiliation with him for sure. Um, So, like, there was one time where Wiley had a show out here. uh, And I just connected him uh, with peeps out here and then had people come out to the show. um, And then we eventually ended up setting up a show together out here, uh, the homie Jordan Willer, he put on an event that uh, me, Wiley, uh, Emmy, who's a singer from out here, and uh, Deepat, who's uh, a producer for Sandra now, uh, with Brent Baez and Atu. I love, dude, they finally got on, because their album, that whatever that album was, came out a while ago. 
yeah. and like they're I, starting to get recognition for it now like i just saw um i think it's the too fast song it, yeah. it, i just saw it on a fucking commercial and i'm like that album came out a few years ago yeah and i remember uh for one of the atlanta previews they used that song uh, oh, okay. atlanta childish uh donald glover's show yeah, yeah, uh, yeah but yeah so we did a show at canvas that jordan willard had set up um and that event was super cool um from there we just you know kept in contact still continued to build uh, i went out to la we worked out in la on a lot of music um and yeah that's what led to where we're at now so we're like really good homies uh we've been working on a lot of things have a lot of things in the works and he it's funny because he's actually starting to do uh, podcast segments of his oh, own shit. as well um and i just did an interview for that so that should be coming out pretty soon too oh wow you gotta send me that when it comes out yeah for sure i will dude yeah me and alex can you do like a fucking podcast collab or something yeah no i'm i'm more than sure he'd be done he's he's a super cool dude so yeah um yeah it's all a matter of just you know connecting hitting them up um but yeah i feel like my goal is that because like chicago definitely has like a music scene but like no one's like boasting about it right so i feel yeah. like i feel like seattle can hopefully come like become like another like chicago in a way like i don't yeah. know if we'll ever become like an la but i feel like chicago yeah. is something we could reach yeah like as far as like the communal aspects that uh like are there like everyone works with like everyone it's like there's people of you know like different subcategories of rap and just other genres as a whole that all collectively work together and i feel like they have a very good support system there same with like you know areas like atlanta and new york you know they 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 have a real close knit like music community mm -hmm. so. so when you first started out in music like all the venues are like in seattle basically or there's some in tacoma but like you were yeah. in Bremerton, like how did, how did you, how were you able to like connect with people? Yeah. So, I mean, I would say like, I didn't really start doing the majority of what I've done musically until after high school. Within high school, it was definitely more so of a finding my sound type thing, uh, you know, still, you know, learning, being a kid. Uh, so there wasn't too many, I wasn't really focused too much on those sort of aspects of uh, the realm of being a, a music artist, like performing, doing shows, because there wasn't like a demand or like a thing for that. Like the, like, because like when you're living in towns like that, you're not like going to concerts or like <laughs> doing things like that because there's, where are you gonna see concerts? Like you're gonna see something either at the Tacoma Dome, which is 45 minutes out, or you're gonna see something in Seattle, which is more than an hour out. Um, and even more so, like if it's shows that, you know, shows happen every night of the week. So it's like, if it were something that were like a school night, it would be borderline impossible to like <laughs> get there and then get back and then go to school the next day. So like the first show I actually went to was Big Sean. Oh, and that was in like 2011 when I was uh, in my senior year. And I actually ended up rapping to Big Sean outside of his tour bus after the show. Wow. And I have a video of that uh, on YouTube and shit. But um, that was like my first show ever. Uh, like I remember we like barely caught the last ferry back to town. Damn. I, I stayed the night at my homie Diego's house and like I was I was just so pumped but like the next morning I was just so tired and I was just at school we we're just at school telling everyone like yo I just wrapped a big Sean yesterday I was like I'm about to get signed but like, that's it's so funny looking back at that now but like there was a couple shows that I did do within the Bremerton area uh like they were just like events you know more like so talent events shows that, maybe yeah like that people set up or like parties things like that but didn't really have like a venue show until I moved out to Seattle um hmm. and you know started networking you know connecting with different people out here that led me to those opportunities to be able to do so yeah see all local Seattle artists there's no excuse <laughs> yeah not at all <laughs> but yeah like 
some people like even like Tyler the Creator, like he th- he, th- he thought it was cool enough to post it like going on a ferry, but like I've had my fair experiences on ferries, and you definitely have too. Like after yeah. a while, like a ferry becomes like a fucking bus ride, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, trust me. I, like we're not looking at that picture of the ferry like it's anything cool, but like from an outsider perspective of Seattle, they're like, oh, what the fuck? Like there's ferries like that you you take a boat as transportation. It's it's like oh, it's a weird idea to people Mm -hmm. and cool in the same breath so like you know it was (laughs) it was interesting seeing people like going wild about it but like at the same time it's like what the fuck is Tyler doing in Seattle like it it also raised that question because it seems like he's out here pretty often and I remember like the first uh loiter squad episode ever was shot in Seattle because I remember they they were doing some shit by uh, the show box. And I was like, what the fuck? And I was like, oh, this is in Seattle. Um, but yeah, yeah. That's it's, crazy. It was interesting. It seems like Seattle is, you know, some people come here and love it. I mean, I love it out here, so I don't I don't blame them. Mm-hmm. But yeah. So you, you live like actually in the Cap Hill neighborhood? Like, how do you feel about that during yeah. these protests and everything? Oh, it's, it's, it's kind of annoying. <laughs> not, not, not like the protest, but like the, you know, the approach that people take to them. Mm-hmm. Um, just cause you know, it's a predominantly white neighborhood. Like I moved out here like during quarantine prior to this, I lived in West Seattle, but uh, you know, it's, it's been good living out here. I love being close to everything. I hate the lack of parking, but you know, get over it but yeah. um it's it's cool being in the mix of things i've i pretty much now within eight years of living in seattle have lived in majority of like the bigger neighborhoods like i've lived in north seattle i've lived on aurora i've lived in west seattle i've uh yeah um white center i've mm-hmm. lived in cap hill first hill like there's a lot of different areas i've stayed within the general seattle area yeah what do you feel about uh Cal Anderson? Like it's like completely overrun with homeless people right now. I think I think Cal Anderson it's it's a dope spot. Um and um it was it was interesting to see during the course of a couple months during uh you know like the protests and whatnot. Um like how like it transformed into like the Chaz and uh, the chop the chop zone, um, and you know now to see it now it's like you know I haven't been out there in a while considering you know uh, the pandemic, but you know it's 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 always been a dope spot. I've I've yeah. always like kicking it at Cal Anderson like during like the block party days everyone would just congregate there like outside of the gates of block party um yeah i, I love Cal Anderson for what it is yeah i hope everything comes back sooner than later but like the way things are looking we're probably out another summer or two <laughs> <laughs> right yeah and what the, i heard they're doing like what operation warp speed or whatever so they're trying to uh push out vaccines uh sooner than later and I guess one of the reps on on that team said like things could be not normal, but like things could be better like by May earliest. Mm. So I don't know how true that that is, but I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, and then you have to worry about like who gets it first: the elderly, the young people, yeah, healthcare workers, it, all that stuff. It, yeah, and I think that's what the they were saying. Like, definitely, like the healthcare workers and like the elderly would be like their first priorities for the vaccinations. Mm. Just crazy that like I keep forgetting like Washington was like one of the first hotspots. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 so crazy, and like now I now that cases are rising. I'm now knowing people firsthand who are having it. Like at first it was like, oh, it was some, I know it's a friend of a friend or aunt of a friend's friend, things like that. But now it's like within one degree of separation to where it's like, oh, it's my friend or like my cousin or my auntie who has it. So Mm -hmm. 
it's you know it's starting to you know set in but you know that they're, they're having a lot more measures it seems for like tackling it uh but you know it's still unfortunate how many people have ended up dying from uh you know a pandemic that you know could have been mitigated if we've had the right measures oh, yeah. in place so exactly. that's very you know disheartening to see yeah it's fucking nuts like I, I definitely have friends in college who knew the pandemic existed and still like threw parties and stuff and of course they like, got it firsthand and i was like fuck yeah and then i have other friends like my family was telling me that there's these type of people out there and I didn't realize it, but there's people who think that if they, they just want to get the um, COVID over with by getting it personally. And that's, you don't want that because there's different strains of COVID. So just because exactly. you get it the first time, you're actually more likely to get it the second time in the worst yeah, strain. So you don't want to get it twice. Yeah. 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 It's not, it's not like the fucking chicken pox where you wanted to have like a chicken pox party. This shit is serious yeah, as fuck. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. No COVID parties for me. Mm -mm. So on your Instagram, I saw you post a post about um, BPE. Can you break that down? The black political education? Yeah. So uh, black political ed education. Uh, it's something I've been doing with uh, a group of friends of mine uh, throughout the course of uh, this pandemic. Uh, we've been organizing together, you know, uh, starting, I want to say maybe like May or June, or it was probably within June, we started uh, like doing weekly Zoom, like twice a week, actually we started at twice a week and then we went down to weekly, like Zoom meetings, just reading different materials, watching different videos, listening to different podcasts and lectures, uh, just pertaining to, you know, abolition, uh, black queer feminism and um, just black radicalism and things like that and just becoming becoming just more knowledgeable on you know the infrastructure and society that we live in and what it means to be black what it actually means to be black within the society we live in and what anti-blackness looks like in our everyday lives. So we've been doing a lot of that. Um, and we did that for about two months and then we tailed off into a book club. So now we're doing book readings uh, in which we just finished our first full book together since we ended the, the summer black political education that we did. And now we are now putting our theories in the practice in which we are now, you know, doing what we know and what we can do with mutual aid and helping out the houseless and most marginalized communities within, you know, our community as a whole. So right now we're doing like a winter supply drive for the houseless communities uh, and, you know, collecting PPE and you, just winter coats, socks, jackets, all those things, you know, to make the living and material conditions of those who feel it most a little better considering the situations that they're in that will never be changed by anyone within our governments. So that's what I've been focused on a lot with, uh, you know, especially after, you know, the George Floyd incidents, the Breonna T Taylor incidents, like, I've always been pretty, you know, keen to what it means to be black within America and, you know, all of the disparities we face. Um, but like, you know, just taking all this time to like, just sit with my thoughts, especially like being isolated, like being within quarantine, you know, it's like, there's more to this. It's like, why, why do black people continuously die at the hands of police? Why are we continuously undermined within our societies? And why this change never happened regardless of who is in a position of power? Mm -hmm. um, and so like just realizing that the power lies within our community and the things that we can do to help shape our communities with each other um, you know, it's just provided a lot of insight for like, you know, shifting my focus on 
where my energy, where I want to put my energy towards. And um, with, you know, politics as a whole, I know they're never going to do shit for Black people. And I've always known that. But now I have more of an analysis on it because I read into theory and I read into, you know, political prisoners and political activists who don't get the shine within media or things like that because their views are very, you know, conflicting to the capitalist state that we live within. So, you know, I've just been unlearning a lot, a lot of propaganda, just unlearning a lot of, you know, things I thought to be true and like, you know, developing a new political understanding of like how the world truly works and what yeah. it truly means to be black within this society. Yeah, that's very important. Like something that I thought was scary but funny that you kind of um you kind of talked about it in your post also. You're saying like how Joe Biden isn't actually a win for the black people, right? So yeah, not at all. <laughs> something that I was thinking about heavily like leading up to the election is that I see a lot of people on social media being like, if you're voting for Trump, go kill yourself or all this random shit, right? And I, yeah. I personally don't like Trump either, right? He's yeah, racist, he but yeah. any, most, honestly, any president's racist, realistically. If you're an old Every white president. guy, you're racist. So what I thought was very interesting was that how social media has honestly become like a swing vote. Like if you mm -hmm. think you're on the right side of society, like all those up and coming like 18 year olds to maybe like 18 to maybe like 25, 26, that's mm -hmm. all most likely going to Joe Biden. Unless yeah. your family is like very into Trump and then you're, you are into Trump because of your family. But like, yeah, I'd say a very high percentage of that age range is definitely. Yeah. more blue than if, you, if you think about it, like when I, I'm not a super political person, but you can notice little things like, mm -hmm if I asked people why they wanted Biden, they're like, oh, I don't, it's because Trump is a sexist, racist pig. Yeah. Realistically, that's any old white guy. Like, yeah. I'm not saying all and white people, people a, suck, but. Yeah, that's not a good enough excuse for mm -hmm. me ever to vote for this because I don't like that. Like, it takes a little more critical thinking for me to, you know, endorse and cast, uh, you know, my support for someone who, in essence, has never been here for Black people. Mm -hmm. So, like, yes, Trump is not here for Black people, but Joe Biden hasn't been here for Black people for 40 years longer. Than and Trump. he actually like, has, like, a track record. You know, like, Trump, yes. this is his first, Trump's first time being, like, political. You know, he's yeah. just more like a businessman, but, like, Joe Biden actually has, like, a pretty racist track record, yeah. you know? He's actually provided turmoil for generations prior to us and generations to come. Mm -hmm. He's caused so much disparities within the black community uh that have ruined families lives and you know that intergenerational trauma is just something that i'm not going to fuck with or support and it's like you know i've witnessed it firsthand in my experiences uh just you know the evil structures of what this society you know upholds but also it's like he's he's not whatever he says it's like he's obviously just saying what we want to hear mm -hmm. it's like it's very contradictory to what his actual actions are and that's why the elections are over over joe biden has won but i'm going to continue to critique all of the things that he's doing within his presidency to show that it is not that much different than trump mm -hmm. Hopefully he does like, grow. Like, hopefully we can see a change. But like, you can't just like assume. He's I'm not change. hopeful. Like, I'm not hopeful in anything within this system. So, Damn. yeah, I'm. I'm just over. I'm. I'm completely divesting from my electoral politics because I know the power with Black people does is does not lie within it. Mm -hmm. So, do you think it's? How do you think people should educate themselves? Like, what are some ways people can educate themselves more about politics or? Read. I feel like no one reads. No one <laughs> reads. That's the thing. No one does the readings. Uh, like, literally, like, 
and it's not it's not just doing the readings but it's like internalizing the readings knowing what you're reading researching it's like studying it's like people don't do these things and it's all about too like looking into the things that our empire vilifies the most they vilify what the most communism socialism they vilify the leaders that stood for these things within other countries those are the types of things i look into and then realize that they statistically have done things for their communities that have raised the gdp have got them out of poverty like all of these things that the us has propagated us to be against mm -hmm. so there's reasons for that obviously because capitalism only works if there is another community at the receiving end of that stick that is receiving the bulk of you know all of the evils that capitalism produces and we know that it is no fucking secret that it's usually black brown and indigenous people globally so it's like if we open up our lens and start to realize like the U.S. doesn't operate only within American politics. They operate within global politics. Foreign policy is something that we as Black people need to have a solid understanding of because they can shout Black Lives Matter and all of these other things here within you know, the United States, say they're here for our liberation, things like that. Yet yeah, you'll hear that months ago, they just bombed a whole community in Africa or the global South or place sanctions, placed embargoes on these countries to where they cannot export their goods uh, that are th their national goods to, you know, pro provide income for their, their economy as a whole uh, on behalf of sanctions that the U.S. places and, you know, things like that. It's like you realize these type of communities that it directly affects and they're all black communities, they're all brown communities, they're all indigenous communities, like they are here in America. But it's way worse. It's way worse over there. It's way worse in these countries that we don't hear any news about. And so, you know, reading into, you know, black radical theory, uh, I've been reading into a lot of, you know, just pan-Africanism, abolition as well. And um, just really understanding that, you know, this is a very sinister machine that we're working with, but, you know, we have to be knowledgeable about it, like in order for things to change. So as an artist, how do you go about incorporating this into your music and do you? Uh, yes, I feel like I, I have, uh, especially with like, uh, with Cosmos, we, I feel like we've we've had very like I've always approached the music like I've made not only with Cosmos but moving forward like in a very like liberating and empowering way uh like songs like I have uh like extra extra um that was a song we had on our moonshine project uh with Paris Alexa and that just highlights you know police killings and um things of that sort and also like songs like Living Proof uh, talking about you know they don't like what I do they don't like what I see they don't like that what I write they don't like that I'm free like that's the chorus of the song which I feel like is you know like it has revolutionary undertones to it you know um, and that was and so in 2017 yeah exactly that 2016 even more so when i wrote the song so mm. it's like i've always had like this i feel like this innate calling to speak up and do more with my music but even now more so that i actually have an analysis on this shit like oh my music it, it's definitely gone up a notch for sure as far as like on a conceptual standpoint mm -hmm. So yeah, Paris Alexa was featured heavily on the that Cosmos project. How'd you come to meet Paris? Yeah, so yeah, Paris, Paris and uh, Mr. DC 
they were like the main like featured vocalists for for the album as a whole. So with Paris, uh, we we met uh, from the EMP sound off competition. So oh, wow. she ended up getting second place, and then we got first. But like she she didn't have a band or anything. So I, I firmly believe if she had a band and a whole like sound, like she holds her own weight on her own. But like she was phenomenal. Like if if we didn't win, I definitely would want her to win by by all means like first time I heard her voice I I had gotten the chills I was like yo she's phenomenal Mm -hmm. like I need to work with her and like I remember because like the first time we had like the meeting for the sound off uh like the little orientation like she had came up to me and she's like oh my god like I I love your music I was just listening to your your stuff on the way here and I was I was just like oh that's so dope and I had no clue who she was and then I saw her sing and I was like, oh my goodness, she is phenomenal. So since then, we've been very good friends. We did the Universal Audio commercial last year with uh, Niles Waters, Nile Waters, which is uh, Nima and Elon. Mm-hmm. Uh, they work out of the Ruby room. Uh, so we were able to do a commercial with Universal Audio. We all got flown out to uh, Santa Cruz area and they treated us for, for the week. Uh, for the release of their new uh, interface that they had, and it was a good, it was a good time. Yeah, I basically um have taken all, only like three, I guess, people off that um Moonshine album. So I have Mr. DC coming up. Um, is it Elon? Elon Wright? Elon. Elon. Elon Wright, yeah. And I also have um Nima coming up. So <laughs> I oh, definitely, no. I definitely used your um. Your your moonshine album as as like a credit page to look and see uh, there's no, some dope no, ass no. features on there so I'm excited no, for all yeah. those coming up. Cool yeah yeah they're all gonna be good people to talk to for sure. Yeah, who's pants like that's you have a few songs with that for or yeah, I don't know if it's a so, band or whatever the fuck that is. Uh, so pants is like it's uh, he he plays keys and cosmos. Uh, he. Uh, it's Ryan Gross, and that's just his his nickname is Pants. Like he okay. he's <laughs> had that nickname since he's he since he was a kid, so it just stuck. And so, uh, yeah, he's just one of the bandmates in Cosmos. My favorite song is the um, "I'm Shooting for This." Is it Stars Sky? Yeah, it's Shooting for the Moon. Moon, uh, Moon, my bad. Moon. Yeah, yeah, Dude, yeah. It like it like dies down. And it goes, I'm sh- that song is just. <laughs> yeah, no, DC killed the hook, Pants killed the production. Yeah, that's that's still one mm-hmm. of my favorite songs. I remember, I remember making all these songs, and it's so it's so cool, like because music is just like a a timestamp in history. So like every time like I hear or someone brings these songs up or I listen to them, it just takes me back to creating the songs and yeah. the time it the time we were doing it, and it's just such a cool thing, like. When I die, like all of those moments are gonna be on my my little reel that comes that <laughs> shows my life from beginning to end. Like when I see those moments, I'm gonna be like, you know what, life was pretty good. <laughs> Dude, yeah, that the album's honestly timeless. I fucking yeah. I've listened to it like three times in a row now. I love it. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I really like it because I still to this day I don't think there is any project out like that like that project is so unique like in sound and approach like it it shows like how different of a brand we had as cosmos Mm -hmm. and you know i don't think that went unnoticed obviously you know we we had the buzz we had when you know we were doing our run of things you know a lot of things happened as we got older changes and also things with this pandemic but it's like there's nothing more that I love doing those moments with the band. Like for sure. That shit was fun. Do you get any inspiration from Chance the Rapper's socks group? Not necessarily uh in on an intentional stand on a, on an intentional front, but um I would be lying to say that I wasn't influenced by Chance as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um I wouldn't say necessarily directly with his band implementation and things like that but um 
yeah, definitely have gotten influenced. Like just growing up, like coming out of high school, listening to all those cats. And that's why it's also just like such a like surreal thing to be like, yo, like I kind of manifested like the moments that led me to, you know, connecting with Alex Wiley and, Hell yeah. you know, making now making music with him. And we're working on like a project together as well. Like, it's like, damn, looking back at it, it's like, I really do make shit happen. Like, I, yeah. I like, I, I am a very ambitious person to where it's like, I make sure if I'm really tunnel vision focused on things like that, it, it leads to attracting like the opportunities that, you know, I envision. For sure. With the, with the Sox group, like, did they just band or anything? And like, I haven't heard anything about like Donnie Trumpet or any of those guys anymore. I'm not even sure. I think um, they might have had, I have no clue, honestly. And it's like, it's kind of hard to determine a lot of things now, considering, you know, the pandemic, like a lot of things are at a standstill, but I'm more than sure they're getting their hustle on in some way, shape or form, whether it be mm -hmm. probably collaborating on production with other artists, um, things of that nature. I know, I know they're probably out there doing that stuff. And I know, you know, when Chance does uh, like, you know, uh, but things like let's say Saturday Night Live or you know things like show TV show performances, I still usually see them all like like mm -hmm. Peter Cottontail and you know like Donnie Trumpet and Sticks like I still see them like playing with them. Uh, of course, he has like b big bands sometimes with like lots of vocalists and things like that. But as far as the core goes, I think I still see them performing. Mm -hmm. My favorite little like mixtapes that Chance has done is the. Did you ever listen to that freestyle album he did with Little B? Yeah, that shit was fire. Like almost no one knows about that. That was fire. Yeah. And then um, oh, that was dope. Every Christmas since it's come out, I've had to listen to both yes. "Merry Christmas, Little Mama" Christmas, Little one Mama, and two. One and two. Yeah, yeah. that's what they're fucking yeah, bangers. I was, I was, I was like Loki disheartened because did you hear about the Jeremiah? Jeremiah, yeah. I was like, damn, it was right around Christmas time too, and like he. I guess he's doing a lot better now, which is good, but I guess he was in the hospital and ventilators and whatnot. Mm. I was like, wow, that's that's sad to know. And even more so, like, it's Christmas time coming up and I know I'm going to be bumping, like, that project. So yeah. both of those projects. So I was like, I I wish, I, I you know, I pray that, that it's not a Christmas where I have to bump that and he's not here. Yeah, like, fuck. I hope they surprise us. I feel like they've probably, like, recorded them back to back there's a chance that they probably like did them like one year and then the next year but i feel like yeah, they did it back to back i think they probably did back to back especially like knowing like how busy artists can be at that stature mm -hmm. like probably getting connected in the studio with people like with, with conflicting schedules is probably super hard to where they're like all right let's lock in for like a week or two get this shit done then be on our ways but, you know, I don't know what type of relationship they have. They could be super close to where, you know, they did do it in two different sessions. But mm -hmm. So for like for you and Cosmos, you guys are still together, right? Like, are you still working on music with them at all? Yeah. And even more so, we're more like we we operate as a band, but we're our own individual artists. So we we collectively we're a collective. So like um, like sort of like the Internet. You know, like each of them have like their own brands. Like Sid has her own solo projects, Matt Martian, Steve Lacey. Um, but yeah, like we all do our own solo music ventures, but link up when need be. Like if there were a show opportunity after all of this stuff, I don't doubt we would link up and do a show. Like mm -hmm. it's not anything that's behind us because we all love to perform. And, you know, we've had a couple different, you know, core members sift in and out since, you know, the whole inception of the band. But, you know, they're gig musicians. They they can play the shit with their eyes closed. So it's not a matter of uh, whether they can play or whether we would be down to play. It's just a matter of, you know, the opportunities. So somewhat i say and i'd say even more so 
with the album I'm working on, uh, a lot of it, like I like to, uh, you know, kind of experiment with different sounds uh, when it comes to different projects and whatnot. So I don't like sticking to like the same format going into a new album, like people anticipating what I'm gonna do with it. So with this new album, uh, there is, you know, there's live instrumentation within there for sure, but um, there's not a lot of things that would sound completely, or would sound complete with the live band, more so than with like being played off of, you know, a system with the 808s and everything like that, that support the songs. But, you know, you can still manage to do those type of things with backtracks and other instruments being played by. And also just, I've networked with so many people. I've worked with a lot of people since Cosmos started too, to where it's like, I love being able to, you know, work with and collaborate with other artists that, you know, can help push and further the sound. So just keeping things fresh and, you know, you know, the path of the artist. For sure. So do you have like a studio on Cap Hill? Because I know there's like a lot of studios that people record at. Over yeah. There. So like in the CD area, I, I work out of my homie Pete Cruz's uh, uh, studio. Silk Sounds is the name of his spot. And it's like an apartment studio, but it's like really official. Like he, it's real put together. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I did the whole new album out of there. He mixed and mastered the whole thing. And I worked alongside uh, my producer, Tyree, who's a producer who, this is the first project I will be releasing with his production on it. But a lot of, the, I've had several singles like Quicksand that dropped last year. And I did like a whole uh, promotion and a whole rollout with that, uh, with like merch and a music video, um, did a website. Um, and that he produced that and several other tracks since then that are out as singles to kind of give like people perspective of like the new sound direction I'm on. But we've just been locking in together and like this is without a doubt my best sounding album today. It from just beats uh, and production to transitions to lyrical content. It's like you can really hear my development uh as a rapper and as an artist for sure so now that even you're pretty pretty established throughout the seattle area like is it important for you to make connections anymore like you do have like you said the alex wiley connection has been a thing up and coming for a while you know Um, Mm -hmm. same with paris alexa so is like connection even a main operation for you anymore within seattle not necessarily i mean Mm -hmm. it's just about doing my thing getting presence on an online front even more so um and you know not really be impressed about where I'm at uh as terms of if I you know like I'm not trying to like oh get big or like I want this big break it's like I'm comfortable being the artist I am not compromising myself and my worth within the art that I'm creating I know opportunities will come exposure will come and just staying true to myself, that's what people like the most. And developing a brand around that. Um, and, you know, a lot of my fans aren't in Seattle. Like, like on a, like, just a Spotify analytical basis. Like, they're spread around. So it's like, the internet is like the biggest tool for connectivity nowadays to where I'm not and even more so, we're in a pandemic. It's like the 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 transition of things is just so much differently now. Not only uh, because I've like exasperated the Seattle market, but also because we're in a pandemic. So even if shit was open, I would still be online, you know, for uh, trying to get my music out there. Because it's like people are so much more I don't know people are so much more willing to listen to an artist that they don't know personally and receiving their music in a 
you know, an unbiased way versus like someone who already has like a perception of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a weird thing for me because like I'm in a different lane compared to anyone. Like I, you know, in a sense, I'm an artist, you know, like podcasting mm-hmm. is an art form. Mm-hmm. And like for me, it's I, I can only give advice to a certain extent. Like for me, it's definitely important for me to realistically know the majority of who's in Seattle. You know, I want them on my podcast. I want to have that Seattle fan base. But when I start to look at like other artists or even at my podcast, like I don't just solely stick to having Seattle artists. Like I've yeah, had on up and coming artists from like Compton, California, mm-hmm. the UK, even like I, I, I diversify, but do you think there's a certain time frame or something that people should look at when they decide when, when they've, when they're comfortable enough to stop focusing on just connecting with like the Seattle scene. Cause it's important think- to have Seattle as a home base, but I don't feel like, if you're an artist knowing every single person in the Seattle music scene is going to get you to where you want to be. The the biggest artists outside of Seattle aren't popping because of Seattle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like Lil Mosey, uh, Travis, I'd say, yeah, he's, he's, he's definitely like Seattle popping and has a lot of his fans from Seattle, but um, you know, I don't, I think both go hand in hand simultaneously. It's like, you don't have to be like, all right, I'm going to work on Seattle and then I'm going to work on this. It's like, you can do them both at the same time. And I think that's, uh, you know, important to understand that, you know, times are changing and the way people get exposed to music are changing. So you got to be a little more creative how you do it. Yeah, 100%. But you definitely came up with a cool group of people like the Travis Thompsons and the Paris Alexis. That's fucking dope. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's good to be homies with people who make dope shit, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, we, we all, you know, gravitate to each other. Cause you know, we're, we're like-minded, we make dope shit. Um, and yeah. What are your opinions of like the little Mosey wave that's going on? Little Mosey as himself and also like people trying to follow that wave in Seattle. Honestly, he's doing his thing. I, I can't even, I can't even front. There's a lot of songs by Lil Mosey that I fuck with and <laughs> like, uh, you know, people have their own opinions about him, but at the end of the day, he's getting money, he's doing what he can, and he's getting better. Like, from when he started to now, he's definitely had an improvement in sound. I fuck with Lil Mosey. Mm. Um, so, like, anyone who's young and Black having success in this world, I'm going to applaud because all the cards are stacked against us. Mm-hmm. I do have to say though, he kind of ruined my childhood. He just came out with a song for the new SpongeBob movie soundtrack. Oh, did he? <laughs> and then it's like it's dope as fuck. Though, like the the lineup is dope. The song is honestly, it's sad that it sucks. But it's like him, Sway Lee, and Tyga together, which is dope as fuck. Yeah. But like <laughs> Tyga is like talking about like smashing Mrs. Puff or something like that, and I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck is this song? <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking hilarious you know there and i don't doubt he's gonna have some misses because it's it's he's mainstream now so it's like you're gonna have misses when you're mainstream but that's hilarious <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah that's crazy he's made some dope ass connections like he's on yg's latest album even like yeah like that yeah uh he's done shit with little baby he's done shit with uh chris brown chris brown gonna like no, he's he's like in there, and he was on the freshman, so like he's up for sure. So and he's, isn't he part of the like um Cole Bennett thing now too? Basically, like the yeah, uh, lyrical lemonade. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like his his manager, Rip Curry Cash. Hmm. Um, I used to hit. I used to kick it with him a lot when he was younger. When I first moved out to Seattle, so him. My homie Nick, who also passed away, him, my homie Nick, and I all used to kick it. And I remember when Bakari was a youngin, and like to see like him grow up and start managing Mosey, like right when he, uh, you know, started getting his break when he was like 14, 15. 
And then now to see where Lil Mosey's at now, I'm like, damn, Kari's up there happy for sure. Yeah, I didn't know NLE Choppa. I don't listen to NLE Choppa personally. But oh, I, I don't either, but I know of him. I didn't realize he's fucking 18. I thought he was like in yeah. his mid-20s. Yeah, he does look, he, he looks young, but he looks older than what he is for sure. Yeah, that's fucking, I don't feel like there's ever been a time where people blow up this young. Like Lil Wayne is an exception. Chris Brown's an exception. Usher's an exception, right? Bow like, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel like it was ever. It's probably because of the internet, I'm guessing. But like this, it was oh, never this prominent. Yeah, it's without a doubt because of the internet. Like kids have access from an early age to where it's like they're being exposed to things that, you know, uh, you know, expand their palate, and you know, get them on the artist wave sooner than later. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So when do you think this um new album's gonna come out? Anytime soon? Like within 2020? So it's it's done. It's definitely done. Not within 2020, considering it's what about to be December. Oh yeah. I I was planning <laughs> to put it out by the end of this year, but I was like, I'm not rushing anything anymore. And I know we're working on this short film. I have a lot of things I'm doing with it. I have a lot of you know ducks I got to get in a row. It's definitely gonna come out. I'd say first quarter, uh, 2021. Um, but. I'm going to make sure this shit is real good. Hell yeah. Well, what is some advice that you have for up-and-coming artists, creators, influencers? Um, just keep doing your thing. Don't be defensive when it comes to criticism, if it's very constructive. If it's nitpicky, that's another thing because people are always going to have their subjectivity when it comes to what they like and dislike about music. Just focus on the people who like your shit find your core fan base, double down on what they want, and stay true to your artistry. Hell yeah. What is the easiest way for people to reach you? Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, at Campana Zone. Uh, nowadays, I'm doing a lot of organizing and shit in the community, so I, I've been focused a lot on just helping my people. So you probably see a lot of posting about me doing things with that, you know, talking politics, you know, I've just been reading a lot honestly. Um, I've been working on music too. Uh, you know, just getting right, just getting myself right. Um, but yeah, hitting me up on Instagram, Twitter, uh, at Campana Zone. Um, if you ever want to chat, you ever have a question, I'm, I'm pretty personable, so I'll, I'll hit you back. I'm not too cool. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> well, this is the NAS podcast with Campana. There we go.